Hello, in this podcast, we're looking at ENSO and El Nino. Our learning targets are to explain how ocean currents can change the climate and to describe the effects of El Nino and La Nina. Put together, that's, this picture was taken in South America, in the western part of South America. And this area here is normally a desert, and those are sand dunes, and these sand dunes are in a lake. The 1982-83 El Nino wreaked havoc throughout Peru, where areas in the north received 30 times the normal rainfall. With no advance warning and no emergency preparations, Peruvians suffered a billion dollars in damages. At the same time, if you go to Indonesia, you'll find a drought, so it's the opposite, and those droughts are causing a fire. At high temperatures, you have much greater evaporation of moisture, and uh, this moisture-laden air, when it rises, condenses and precipitates out in the form of rainfall. Uh, during El Nino years, the uh, heavy precipitation that is normally found over the western part of the Pacific, Australia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, migrates eastward with the warm water. And uh, so what that does uh, almost immediately is it leaves Australia, Indonesia, and that part of the world high and dry. Drought, potentially famine, and all the ramifications that go with that. In Indonesia, Farmers light fires every year to clear forests for planting. Normally, they can rely upon the rains of monsoon season to douse the flames. But during the El Nino-induced drought, fires raged out of control, filling the air with choking smoke, pushing pollution levels to record highs, and sending tens of thousands of people to seek medical aid for respiratory ailments all because the rain moved eastward. Go to Brazil in the eastern part of South America, you also find droughts. In Florida, there'll be droughts, and in California, heavy rain. Dislocated jet streams deliver fierce storms to California that would ordinarily land far to the north in Alaska or Canada. California's magnificent coastlines normally erode four inches a year. But during the first few months of the 1998 El Nino, some cliffs retreated 10 feet. Despite early warnings, scores of homes could not be saved. The winter storms this year have been really remarkable and I think a number of us scratching our head because you can look at a satellite picture and you see them lined up particularly in February three or four of them all coming zip right across the ocean and the path they took was just you know bam bam right into central California time after time. In parts of Africa you'll find heavy rain, other parts of Africa famine. Look at this part right over here you see that normally there you've got this cold current and the white arrow here stands for a cold current a cold current coming to South America that usually means that the water there is high in nutrients and be a lot of fish there for the fishermen and then the current normally goes west and that's what you see here in a normal year trade winds go west and the waters and you end up with warm waters piling up in the western Pacific and that gives lots of rain in the western Pacific and it's dry in the eastern Pacific normally in Peru there would be dry climate and in Indonesia you end up with the wet climate so here I have it written. So here I have it written down for you. In a normal and neutral year, equatorial trade winds blow westward, water piles up in the western Pacific. Water is warmer in the western Pacific, and upwelling of colder water in the eastern Pacific Ocean. So you've got normal precipitation. Now in an El Nino year, and we really don't know what causes this to happen, but the currents will some the trade winds the currents will shift to the other direction where the cur where the currents will go towards the east rather than towards the west the trade winds will weaken or even reverse and that will cause the low to shift from the western pacific to the central pacific and this shows the global effects of el nino because the effects are 
are, are actually global. First, you see here's that low, which is found in the Central Pacific over Tahiti. And where previously it would be raining in a normal year, we have a high. So there we have droughts. Then over here, where Peru is, we'll find we'll find rains right where before it was dry. And because the water there is so warm, that means that you don't have that upwelling of the cold water. So, so that the fishery industry will collapse. In area Brazil, like we saw, that's going to be drier. Southeast United States is wetter. And the jet stream over North America is lower. And that brings, for us in New York, colder temperatures. And you see the high off California means it's drier. You see in equatorial Africa, it tends to be wetter than normal. And then in southeastern Africa, it's drier than normal. So here, it's more written down for your notes. Trade wouldn't slow and, and or stop in an El Nino year. Warm water covers more of the equator. There's no upwelling in the eastern Pacific, so it's a collapse of the fishing industry in Peru. And there's a global change in weather and patterns. And so is, it stands for the El Nino Southern Oscillation Cycle. So during normal years, equatorial trade winds blow west. The ocean is half a meter higher and warmer in the western Pacific. Upwelling currents in the eastern Pacific. And there's 20 to 30 centimeter annual precipitation in San Diego, which is 8 to 12 inches of rain. Now, a La Nina year will sometimes follow an El Nino year. And it's just the swing of the pendulum in the other direction, and it goes further in the other direction. So it's like a normal year, but it's further than a normal year. Trade winds go in the regular direction, but it's much more than before, much more than a normal year. So we'll see a more intense normal year. So what we saw in the El Nino year, it's the opposite. If you look on here, where we had a low before, now we have a high. Where it was wet, it's dry. Where it's dry, it's wet. In Peru, before it was overly wet, now it's overly dry. In the southern United States, it was wet, now it's dry. You see how the jet streams has gone up a little bit further over North America. You see during the La Nina year, in the eastern part of the United States, there tend, and in the Caribbean, there are more hurricanes. Over Australia and Indonesia, you've got the low back there. You've got the low back there. It's more into So here I've written down is increased velocity of the westward trade winds. Colder water along more of the equator, especially the eastern end. Once again, a global change in weather patterns. How do we forecast the ENSO cycle? Very important to be able to do that because it's very important to be able to do that so farmers know if there's going to be a drought or if there's going to be a flood. And same thing for the fishermen. The 1997-98 El Nino left a quarter of a million people homeless. Nearly 300 dead. And an unknown number of casualties from malaria and cholera. Diseases that inescapably arise from stagnant floodwaters. But the advance warning of El Nino did help some Peruvians prepare for the onslaught. Based on an estimate that every dollar spent on prevention would save $10 in disaster relief, the government began widening some waterways in northern Peru that were sure to overflow. In 1983, it was uh, six uh, months or eight months, not only of water, but of mud. Now, uh, the f flood may stay six hours, ten hours, but after that, the city again is clean. That's a big difference. You need information about the sea surface temperatures about, and about the ocean temperatures of depth and also about the winds. In order to do that, you need buoys, both at the surface and deep down. So here you see the buoy that we saw before, and you see this anchor down there. You don't just have the sensors at the surface, but the sensors further down, giving you everything that you need. In order to understand El Nino, and to be able to predict more precisely when it will occur, Mike McFadden and a group of scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration needed more information from the Pacific. Their work began in 1984 at NOAA's Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory in Seattle. Their plan was to track El Nino by building a network of electronic sensors attached to buoys. 
These buoys measure all the critical environmental parameters you need to know for understanding El Nino. They measure the surface winds, the surface temperatures, the upper ocean temperatures, and at some locations they measure ocean currents. It took 10 years to move 70 buoys from concept to lab to ocean. But by 1994, the first El Nino early warning system was in place. Stretching across 8,000 miles of the Pacific Basin, it was one of the largest scientific instruments ever built. I would describe our buoy system as not necessarily high-tech. I would describe it more as ingenious. We make use of technology where it suits our purposes. We do use state-of-the-art electronics, uh, state-of-the-art environmental sensors, state-of-the-art satellite communications. But we've designed the system to be very low power, so we can run them on flashlight batteries. The buoy array is maintained by a NOAA ship called the Kaimi Moana, Hawaiian for the ocean seeker. The crew of scientists and sailors spends 260 days a year tending the system. On the eve of the next major El Nino, forecasters would have a new weapon in their diagnostic arsenal. They'd have the buoy array. The buoys would provide the first accurate portrait of the entire Pacific Basin, precise enough to calibrate satellites that were once deceived by a volcano. I think the strength of the El Nino observing system uh, is that we have both a combination of satellite measurements and in the ocean measurements. The satellites give you a global picture. Unfortunately, they see only the surface. If you want to understand what's going on below the surface, you have to put instrumentation into the ocean. Now we're at our concluding questions. Number one, which direction do trade winds blow in a normal year? Number two, which direction do trade winds blow in an El Nino year? Number three, what does ENSO stand for? Number four, how does El Nino affect the United States? And number five, how is La Nina different from El Nino? Well, that concludes this podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow in class.